This afternoon we have Professor Anna Vignolis and Dr. Susan Purden. Um, Professor Vignolis is Professor of the Economics of Education at the Institute of Education in London. I should tell you, just before she starts, that as an educational researcher, the advent of economists into educational research has been nothing but a positive. It has brought a rigour and an attention to statistical data that was on the whole lacking before. So very much look forward to hearing what Anna has to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lindsay. And I've, I've never been introduced in such a positive way about being an economist before, so it's a real, it's a really, real nice pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Anna Vinny, as you say, from the Institute of Education, and I um, was a deputy director of ADMIN, which was an ESRC uh, methods node, an NCRM uh, methods node, which was uh, charged with looking at linked administrative data and linked survey administrative data and trying to see what we could do with it to improve quality of research. Research. Most of the research we did was methodological, but always with a, a, an applied kind of framework in mind as well. And, and a lot of the applications were in the field of education. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we use linked administrative data in this case to look at school effectiveness. Um, for those of you either who have to choose schools for your own children or who are uh, steeped in the literature, you know that school effectiveness and how we measure it is a particularly contentious issue. Um, the debate on school league tables and uh, indeed whether we should be testing our children at all has gone on for, well, about 15 years. Um, so what we were trying to do with this project was um, to some extent step back from the question of whether we should be measuring uh, school performance in the first place and ask whether or not the information that we have available um, to parents to school governors, to, to the government about schools is, is useful and in what way do we think it could be made more useful? So that was our research objective. Um, so as you may know, in England at least, now uh, the Department for Education does provide a range of information about schools. Uh, historically, you've been able to get raw data, and by raw data I mean things like you know, your average GCSE score or the proportion of children getting five A stars to C at GCSE in, a, in an English school. Um, obviously, uh, there's a huge problem with measuring school performance, um, just as we've seen earlier today when you're measuring any uh, kind of organization's performance, you need to think about what it is you're actually trying to capture. And there's a huge problem with measuring school performance by looking at outcomes. And the reason for that is that obviously uh, the extent to which you expect a child to do well, say, at a, a test at age 16, is at least partially determined by... Uh, their level of achievement when they entered the school, uh, in this case at the age of 11. And so in the education literature there's always been an acknowledgement that we need to be thinking about value-added value added models where we take account of, of the achievement of the children as they enter the school and try and capture some measure of the gain in their academic achievement as they go through um, their schooling. Unfortunately, parents may not quite see it that way, and although the Department for Education has done an awful lot to provide measures of value added, and in, in, including uh, the model there, which is a contextualized value added model, which is a model that not only takes account of the prior achievement of the pupils, but also some other factors, such as their deprivation. Um, so it's, it's done very well providing that information, and if you go to their website, you can find that information about the school that you're interested in. But recently suggests that parents um, prefer kind of the bottom line. They often are governed more by GCSE scores, for example. So they're not really necessarily taking on board um, uh, to the extent that they might the fact that you need to take account of the school's intake before you can judge what the school is doing in terms of performance. So one of the first things we need to do in this field is think about very simple measures that are simple enough that parents will understand what you're trying to get at and uh, uh, you know, use them, but also com complex enough that they take account of the achievement of the pupils as they enter the school. So that's the first thing we need to think about. But the second thing is that schools are not um, homogeneous places, and by that I mean when a child enters the school, the experience they have at that school may be very dep uh, different depending on the type of child that they are. And it's been known in the literature for quite some time, since the early 1990s, that some schools are better for different types of children. And specifically that, say, a higher achieving pupil might do better in school A, whilst a lower achieving pupil might be do doing better in school B. If you're a parent, 
it's not enough to know that the school has an average high GCSE score. What you actually need to know is where is it going to take my child? My child starts at this point. Where is my child likely to end up if I send him or her to this school? Now, for those of you who do evaluation, you'll know immediately there's a major problem in the room here, which is the selection that parents make in terms of uh, their schooling for their children. So to some extent, all the measures that we're looking at today um, assume that you can allow for that selection by measuring the prior achievement of the children as they enter the school. And that is a, a complicated issue, which I'll come back to in a moment. But if we set that on one side and say, OK, even if we just take league tables in their own terms, it really isn't enough to have one measure per school. We need to know what schools are doing for different types of children so parents can make more informed choices. Okay. So we concluded that we did need to come up with some cleaner measures. Um, simple, yes, understandable. These things are important, otherwise parents won't use them. But measures that think about what the school's actually doing. So the, the, the distance that they're taking the child. And for that, we, it means we need to think about the factors that would influence the likely trajectory of that child. So anything that we do in that area has to take account of the social background of the young person. Um, and for that, we need good administrative data that includes measures of the social background of children. Uh, in England, we don't have that by any stretch of the imagination. We have a data set that is wonderful in that it's a population, so we know an awful lot about the achievement of children in England, but we have no measure of the social background of the children in the English system. All we have is whether or not they're eligible for free school meals, which as you would imagine is, is an indicator that the family is on income support, um, but that's a pretty crude measure of the, the family background of the child. But nonetheless, that's what we have. Now, what we did to overcome that problem in admin was to link our school's data set to other data, mostly administrative and geographical data, to try and get a better understanding of the social background of that child. Now, we can't pull in data on the exact family background characteristics of the child, but we can say an awful lot about where the child lived, the kind of neighbourhood they were in, the kind of house they were in, and by that we can construct a measure of their family background, albeit a, one with some measurement error in it. So with that in mind, with our linked data, we then measured, and I'll show you how we did it in a minute, the extent to which schools are, uh, are adding value and whether they're adding value to all students in the school or whether they're adding particular va value at the low end or the high end in terms of the achievement distribution. Um, why would we do this apart from to help parents? I mean, obviously helping parents it might be useful in itself. But another issue is that we want to provide schools with incentives that are non-distortionary. If you tell a school that the only thing that matters is the proportion of pupils that get 5A star to C, as we all know, they run away and focus on those on the CD border, uh, trying to get kids up from the D to the C. If, on the other hand, you just have an average GCSE score, then schools will tend to encourage activities that maximize the average GCSE score. And that might involve not paying much attention to those who are always going to get A stars or A's, and not much attention to those who are never going to achieve their GCSEs. And so one of the, the aims of this research was to think of measures that could not only measure the effectiveness of the public service that's being delivered, but actually influence the direction that that public service might be encouraged to go. And the direction we I assume everybody would agree that we want it to go, is to have attention to children from across the range of the ability distribution. Um, in all the work that we do on school effectiveness and school league tables, this is a, an issue that we keep having to come back to. When you measure public sector performance, you influence behaviour. Um, and it's something we've not really heard much about today, but it's, it's absolutely critical to our understanding of what we do as academics when we're measuring performance of any institution. Um, if we measure it in a particular kind of way, and particularly if we have impact on government, uh, and government starts measuring it in that way, we will be influencing the behaviour of public bodies, and we have to be sure that if we're doing that, that the incentives that's, that are being set up are not detrimental um, to particular individuals. So what do we do? Um, this is not a, a high-tech solution, um, and the reason for that is parents don't want high-tech. 
because then they won't use it and they'll resort to using average GCSE scores. So it's a very simple approach, which I'm going to describe. But what we did, of course, do was uh, check its robustness to using more complex random effects, multi-level models, um, and see the extent to which we could use our simple approach to proxy, roughly, um, our more complicated one in the hope that the simple one would be sufficient. And it turns out it is. So what we did is we divided the pupils in terms of their prior achievement. So in our case, we were focusing on measuring the performance of secondary schools. You could do this in primary, but our interest was secondary. And we divided pupils up on the basis of their key stage two test scores. Um, and parents are not given a precise test score. Most parents don't get um, detailed test score information, but they know the level that their child is at in terms of the key stage two tests. So we can then divide the population of school children into different groups as they enter the school, and then all we have to do is look at the performance of those different groups within a school. So we say, okay, let's put, look at everybody in the bottom group and see what they achieve, and we can then compare the performance of that school for that particular group of children uh, against the performance of other schools. And we ended up with these eight different attainment groups, which I'll explain which ones they were in a minute. And with those eight groups, we can then have eight measures of the performance of a particular school. Um, the other thing we can do statistically is determine whether or not the performance of the school varied across those eight groups. And then we can have a very simple answer to the question, is that school differentially effective? In other words, is there a sense that this school is adding more value for, say, higher achievers than, they, than it is for lower achievers? So there were two things that we were doing here. One is coming up with a measure for the performance of that school for your particular child that sits in that particular prior attainment group, but also, more generally, can we get some estimates of whether or not, at the moment, under the current system, schools are indeed differentially effective. The data we used, um, I've alluded to already, is the um, English National Pupil Database, which is linked to the pupil level school census. So what that gives us is a population of English students, um, about half a million in each cohort, and we have two cohorts that we consider. Um, that data has very good uh, achievement data, as you know. So we have tests at um, age 11 and tests at age 14 and tests at age 16. So no shortage of testing in the system. Um, but it's a bit weaker on describing the characteristics of the pupils. But we have, as I said, enough, I think, to, to, to run the models. Um, the other thing I should note at this point is you could, I suppose, think about doing this for private schools, but because not all private schools participate in these tests, uh, in, in this instance we're restricting our analysis to state schools only. Okay. So um, for those of you who don't know the system or don't have children in England, um, it's a quite a complicated system. You take tests in English and maths. You also took them in science, but because that's being discontinued, we're focusing on English and mathematics. Um, the expected level of achievement of an 11-year-old um, is level four. Um, obviously, some children fall below that. Some children fall above that. And because you've got the two subjects, you technically have um, five by five combinations of mathematics and English. But that would be A, very complicated, and also some of those groups are empty or virtually empty. So what we did is we divided the, the, the groups up into the eight that you see there, which are below level three, level three, three, four, three, three, four, etc. So uh, the minutiae of how we divide the groups is not an important point, but it's just to illustrate the fact that a parent would come along and say, my child has got a four in English and a three in maths. That child would sit in that group there. So then you can read off what the performance of that school would be for that particular type of child. Okay, so what about the, the performance measure? What are we actually measuring in terms of the effectiveness of this particular public service? Um, well, as it's secondary schools and as we're looking at the English um, system, we're going to express the outcomes in terms of GCSE scores. I'll come to, to it at the end that you might think about using other measures, but for this analysis we did GCSE scores. Um, and then you have the measure, uh, the problem of how you measure success in terms of GCSE scores. You'd think it was obvious you should just go for the maximum score, but you can achieve a higher score at GCSE by taking lots of subjects and doing badly than if you take a fewer number of subjects and do very well. So there are issues about how many GCSEs you want to include. Uh, 
what we've also found in England, going back to the issue of um, schools being driven by incentives, because there's so much pressure on schools to achieve higher points at GCSE, and because not all GCSEs or equivalents are alike in terms of difficulty, what you find is schools tend to encourage students to take easier subjects. Um, and so you can maximise your GCSE score by taking easy subjects, or you can maximise your GCSE score by making people do English and maths really well. Um, and obviously the latter might be closer to what a parent would be interested in terms of quality. And the way we deal with that is um, the eight GCSEs that we look at have to include English and maths, and in fact we double count English and maths. So this is a, a measure that is loaded towards a more academic measure of a achievement at GCSE. And indeed this is the measure that the government in England at least has adopted in their official modelling to get round some of the problems that I've been describing. So what do we find? So we've taken these eight groups and for every school in the country, three and a half thousand I think secondary schools, we have calculated the average GCSE points for their top eight GCSEs, including maths and English, uh, for each of those groups, and then looked at them. And we have tested statistically whether or not schools tend to be differentially effective. In other words, whether on average schools tend to uh, do better for some students than other. And what we found, I think, is quite interesting. Around about 30 to 40 percent of schools do appear to be differentially effective. But that number is quite sensitive um, to various statistical parameters. So if we were being very conservative, we would say one in five, one in six schools appear to be differentially effective. And in the sense they're adding a lot more value for some pupils than for others. Um, and the estimates of the extent of this differential effectiveness does vary according to what precise measure of achievement that you're using. Um, but I think another point to take away is that even if you use different measures, you're coming up with quite similar answers. There's a high correlation uh, between the different measures that we adopted. And so our kind of summary from this research was that around about one in six schools minimum would be counted as being differentially effective. Now, whether that's a large number or a small number depends on your perspective, but I guess from a parent's perspective, um, you know, that's an important, important fact. The other thing that matters is um, it, it could be that schools are differentially effective, but in a kind of random-y kind of way. Um, what parents want to know is, or what we wanted to know is, if a parent looks at an average measure, will they get a good indicator, indication of the effectiveness of that school for their child? Or would they be better off ranking in terms of their child's prior attainment group? Um, and what we found was that the rank of the schools that you would choose if you were maximizing the scores look very, very different if you choose the average measure as opposed to the measure that would be best for your child's prior attainment group. In other words, we can get more information from the administrative data that we have, uh, either as a parent or as a regulator, by measuring it in a slightly more sophisticated way and taking account of prior achievements. Um, and so, for, uh, for, as I say there, for a non-trivial proportion of schools, it does appear to be important for parents to take account of the fact that they may be particularly biased, stroke-focused on a particular subgroup of pupils. And the other interesting thing, just as an aside, that came out of this was that uh, large proportions of schools in our system, in England at least, um, don't actually have um, popular, uh, pupils in certain groups. Yeah? And I'm not just talking about grammar schools. Uh, some of the religious schools, for example, value, uh, the, the faith schools in England, don't appear to have lower achieving pupils in large numbers of them. So there's, there's lots of ways in which the school that you're looking at is a, is a particular school with a particular intake, and it's really important that we use this rich information to tell you about performance. Um, so in summary, what, what the research that we've done, and I've put the reference up there because it's being published in Fiscal Studies um, this month, I think, or shortly. Um, it shows you that depending on which measure you use, say a quarter to 40% of schools are differentially effective. As I said, the conservative measure one in six. Um, but actually, this will apply to a larger number of pupils than that number implies, because it tends to be that larger schools are more likely to be differentially effective. So it's going to affect a large, numbers, a large number of pupils. Um, and we conclude from this that having a single measure is not very informative. What we're suggesting is that rather than setting a single target, 
um, across all schools and saying, you know, this is, everybody should be achieving this. What we need to think about is setting targets by prior attainment group and thereby not letting schools off the hook by forcing them to, to add value to their different types of pupils. And it's much less likely that, a, say, a particular group of low ability pupils will be ignored. Okay, so how would it work? This is very simple in practice. I think that this is workable. The government could introduce it. You would just need parents to know which group their child was in, um, and then you could publish eight numbers per school. Um, what I would say, however, is that you are having these potentially distortionary effects by getting schools quite as focused as they are on GCSE schools. GCSEs are just a step on the way. They're not real outcomes. They're achievement measures. And so actually, in the bigger picture of things, you might want schools focusing on things that really matter, like employment, like higher education participation, like what happens to their students after they leave school. And such things are much less subject to manipulation by the school themselves. Equally, a teacher might say, well, that's very unfair. I don't want to be judged on my you know, children's employment rate because they're in a really difficult area and, and they're not going to get jobs. That's a fair point, but you can make adjustments for that. What is important, though, is that we get schools focused on what matters to kids, and that isn't necessarily maximizing their GCSE score. So in your handout, I'm not going to discuss it now, but there's a, a table of what the results would look like if we had done the analysis by the eight groups for this year's league tables. Uh, and it doesn't come out well on the slide, but in your handout, if you're interested to know what the data would really look like uh, across England, if you use the eight group approach, it's, it's in there. So um, basically we're saying if we focus on 5A stars, rather than saying every school should meet the national average, we're saying every school should aspire to meet the, the national um, minimum level, not national average, um, by prior ability group. And that would give us richer information and force schools to add across the ability distribution. Um, I've also included um, a series of references there which may or may not be useful for people who are, are interested in this. And I would just draw your attention not only to the fact that the research is published in fiscal studies, but also the Goldstein paper, which is a particularly good account of uh, the limitations of league tables, the difficulties of measuring school performance by using these kind of metrics. And he highlights a whole load of other problems that I haven't really had time to, to focus on, but would be useful reading. Thank you.